through the excellent relationship shared by the co-conveners today <laughs> by assisting each other on this. So what I'm going to be doing is continuing a the theme that in fact started right at the beginning of the day with the Secretary's remarks, which is the idea of diversity in Australia's diplomacy. So to keep you awake, I've got a mental exercise for you. Bring into your head, what is your vision of a diplomat? <laughs> Something like that. Okay, so this fine gentleman is Sir Henry Mortimer Durand, who has the Durand line between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, this may be your mental image. This is a quite different one. Does anyone know what that is? That's all our heads of mission around the world at the moment. So this is our ambassadors and high commissioners representing <coughs> us overseas perhaps a little bit more diverse than my first image. So my presentation is going to talk about the case for diversity in diplomacy. I'm going to look a little bit at how Australia rates internationally, and then I'm going to spend most of my time looking at a case study of DFAT's uh, Indigenous Recruitment and Career Development Strategy, which I'll probably shorten it to Indigenous Strategy most of the time. Um, I think it's an example of a sustained effort to increase diversity in diplomacy. Um, it's very unusual in world terms, and I think offers a lot of useful lessons for others. Um, I've been working closely with DFAT uh, on this, and I really thank them for giving me access to the information they'll be presenting, and I'd like to thank Susie Wilson and Jill Collins for all their help in that process. So, the case for diversity is pretty simple. Two bases. One, function, <coughs> another, representation. So, the functional one is that diverse organisations perform better. Okay, and we can see that in lots and lots of different uh, uh, milieu. Um, they're more productive, they're more innovative. There are reasons why you would want more diverse organisations. Particularly for diplomacy, there's an argument about representation, that this is a key institution of Australian society, and if we want people in society to have respect for this, to see it as having legitimacy, then we have to make sure that it broadly represents the population. And I think that argument is strong, particularly with diplomacy, where we're talking to the literal face of your country abroad. You want the diversity of your society to be represented. So if we're looking at DFAT, how does it rate? As I said, you can see from this, it is pretty good. And if you were going to tell somebody in DFAT 50 years ago that DFAT would look like this, they would have been very surprised. So we're thinking, 50 years ago, we still had the marriage bar. Um, women who, for younger people in the audience, women had to resign on marriage. And if you think that feels like ancient history, we've had people in the room here today who were affected by that in their careers. Uh, if you look at the gender diversity side, Australia they rates very well, I think, in its female participation. So what you're seeing there is, I suppose, where we would want to be broadly in a group of similar um, nations. Um, now, as the Secretary said this morning, uh, women have been entering DFAT in similar numbers since 1985. Women are now 57% of DFAT staff, but they are still underrepresented at, at senior level. Um, and I, in research I did for the Australian Journal of International Affairs last year, I looked at the, the reasons for that, the legacy of, of direct discrimination in the past, continuing indirect discrimination um, in terms of networks, uh, differential impact of family responsibilities, and also a social construction of gender. What are sort of hard issues that might not be seen as so feminine? As you've heard from the Secretary, uh, this is a real priority for the Department. Okay, so there's the Women in Leadership Initiative, and uh, DFAT is now involved with the Male Champions for Change, of Change Group. Um, and I also note this is not the only area that DFAT is working in. So there is a disability action strategy, for example, that DFAT's working in. But what I'm going to focus on as a case study is the Indigenous Recruitment and Career Development Strategy. And if you want to see it in a bigger picture, it is part of a reconciliation action plan. So it's not just about DFAT's workforce, it's also <coughs> about reconciliation more broadly. And an Indigenous People Strategy, which goes as far as talking about how Australia should be advocating and including the rights of Indigenous people more broadly in the international forum. So we can see it as part of a much wider strategy. But if I'm looking specifically at what DFAT's doing in order to increase the diversity of its workforce, um, you can get a sense from this of instrumentally 
um, there's a lot of institutional effort being put behind it, um, and particularly over a long period. So there's three broad areas that, that the strategy focuses on. It focuses on workplace environment, it focuses on recruitment, um, and it focuses on retention. So in terms of workplace environment, it's about having a comfortable and welcoming work environment, supporting Indigenous employees, observing cultural protocols, recognising cultural days of significance and using inclusive language. In terms of recruitment, it's advertising strongly to Indigenous applicants, and that means using Indigenous media and accessible language. It's targeted recruitment of particular um, Indigenous cadets, trainees and graduates <coughs> into the system. And then a special effort put into lateral recruiting of Indigenous uh, people from other parts of the public service. And then in terms of retention, the strategy states that there will be real effort put into providing career pathways for Indigenous employees to try to make sure that they are retained. Uh, that's things like mentoring, um, there are identified positions, uh, for example, in public diplomacy, um, uh, position to the Torres Strait issues, where the job impacts strongly on Indigenous issues or requires interaction with Indigenous um, communities. They don't have to be filled by Indigenous applicants, but the uh, competencies are very much taken into account in filling those positions. So that's in a nutshell what's been done. So the questions I looked at was what's been achieved, what are the challenges, and what can be learned from this in terms of diversity more generally. In terms of the achievements, there's some really high profile ones. So, you know, first Indigenous ambassador representing Australia overseas, that's a headline. And um, it's a particularly good one because he's gone the whole way through the program. So he came in as a cadet and then went to be an Indigenous graduate and then worked the whole way through the program and now he's an ambassador to Denmark. I hope he's having a nice time. <laughs> um, also, for people inside the system, perhaps you know there was the sound of a glass ceiling breaking when Julianne Bavaro was appointed as the first Indigenous Senior Executive Service Officer. Um, I think, though, I mean, they're the big stories, but in some ways the, the, the bigger story is the number of staff across the organisation. So we're looking from 1993 to now, we've gone from 20 Indigenous officers up to 70%, 70 Indigenous employees in DFA, which comes to about 2% of, of staff. And a large proportion of those are serving and representing <coughs> Australian overseas. And my perspective, we, we're still working on getting all of the data for it, but internationally, I think these are superb results. I think there are very, very few foreign services in the world who could boast anything like this. And I've certainly been very surprised by looking, say, at the US, where I think they have nothing of nearly of the quality as you've seen here. So as a researcher, not just a PR outfit, I wanted them to assess, well, how, how do we feel that the, the, uh, the strategy has dealt with some of the potential challenges? And the same ones I identified for gender diversity also apply here. So there's a potential for all of these to apply. Now, in terms of direct discrimination, um, we didn't find any direct discrimination, um, and that's good. I don't think I expected to. Um, what we did find, though, was there were some, some times where creating special pathways for Indigenous people had created unintended consequences, if I can put it that way. So uh, you create an Indigenous cadet program which goes straight into an Indigenous graduate program, because that's a wonderful pathway. But then because you've created this way, you find that someone who goes from cadet to graduate actually gets worse conditions than the people who came straight in. You know, so it's those sort of things is what I felt. Um, those really are legacy issues as far as I can tell. Where they've been identified, they've been fixed. And they're in a way, you know, they're, they're about the, the fact that creating different pathways for Indigenous people can have these unintended consequences. Um, but, you know, we, the people who talked to us were adamant that for many of them, if there hadn't been these pathways, they wouldn't have been here. So from that perspective, yes, it's unfortunate, but you fix it when, when you see the problem. Um, I, there's also some things that are, you know, currently I think being worked on, things like trying to improve pathways for Indigenous trainees who come in at 
suppose, understand an APS2 level, whether or not there are positions for them, and so, again, why has to be done. But I was regarding those as the sort of yeah, adjustments one needs to make. Um, in terms of the second potential issue in direct discrimination, that's when something which looks like a neutral policy has a differential impact because of <coughs> my experience. Uh, we certainly saw some of that. So, I mean, one, one question that was, that one example that was noted was a question on a DFAT form asking if you have a family member in jail. And that might be a really different experience if you're an Indigenous Australian than if you're not. Um, so there can be things like that. Uh, I thought the thing that seemed the biggest problem from what I was listening to was that um, the DFAT culture, I believe, was reported to me, is a very competitive one. Um, it's competitive in terms of placements, <coughs> promotions. At all stages, you have to compete with others and promote yourself. Um, and there's certainly a, a lot of discussion about the role of patronage in career progression. And I think that culturally can be difficult for Indigenous employees who may or may not find that a comfortable way to try to progress their careers. Uh, not surprisingly, we found that there was some impact of family and cultural responsibilities. Um, as the Secretary talked about today, family responsibilities are an issue for everybody. Uh, the way it was talked about with us, that you know, it's hard enough to manage work-life balance. Well, what if you're doing work-life community balance? You know, you've got a whole other set of responsibilities that impact on you. Um, and some of the people, one of the person we spoke to reported, you know, actual pressure from his community. Why aren't you here? You've got a role in the community. You're needed here. What are you doing there? And DFAT takes you far, far away from your local community. So I think there are some of those pressures. And then lastly, and again, this was similar when I was looking at gender diversity, um, you know, there's a real potential challenge about social constructs, about those unconscious ideas we have in our head about what a foreign policy officer should look like. Uh, and there is a tendency in all places and all times for people to promote people who resemble them in some way. Okay. And I think that's just something one has to work with. Um, some of the Indigenous employees we talked to reported that they wanted more recognition of the, um, you know, the skills and experience that they bring to DFAT, that the cultural competencies they have are actually very valuable and might be overlooked uh, sometimes. <coughs> Um, and they definitely reported in some cases that they had to contend with lower expectations um, of them, of their work, that you can have a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you think the, you know, Indigenous person who has just been assigned to you can't do the harder task and you don't give them to them, well, how do you ever find out? Um, if I'm being fair, I would have been surprised if we hadn't seen some of that. Um, every workplace in Australia is a reflection of the wider community. And the wider community has had very negative stereotypes for some time. So one of the things I think one has to deal with there is how do you help bring out those unconscious biases? How do you help change the culture? And I see a lot in what that's doing that achieves that. So there are certainly constraints um, in dealing with these problems. Uh, I, I think from what I saw, people who are running the program are very aware of all of these issues. Uh, there are some necessary constraints, things like resource constraints, and if you talk about, what is it, 19 years of resource cuts now, something like that, that's going to impact on what you can do, even if you have the best policy in the world. Uh, I think we saw very clearly that implementation is harder than strategy. Uh, if you read the strategy on paper, it's magnificent, and I don't think I could think of anything to make it better but how do you then turn that into something in practice? So there were particular elements, things like mentoring, which were fantastic in theory, but did they always happen in practice? Yeah, often not, and that, that's been very difficult for people. Um, we saw very clearly that retention is harder than recruitment, um, and uh, it, it's very nice to see just what a very marketable quantity all of the wonderful Indigenous uh, officers are. Um, all the other APS uh, departments have their own targets to meet as well. So there's a real sense that it's, you know, the Indigenous staff here can be very, you know, a very attractive, can be given great offers. I think that doesn't mesh perfectly with the DFAT culture, which, as I understand it, is a little bit more like, well, you're very lucky to be here. There's a lot of other people who would like your job, 
And I think that sort of trying to retain people and understand what they offer the organisation, that, that might be an area for the potential focus. Thank you. I'm on my second last slide. Uh, and my last point is that I, on this, I suppose, is that the broader organisational culture has an effect. So, you know, uh, things like do that work involve recruitment rounds? That has an effect then on what do you do with Indigenous people who don't get to perhaps choose as much their pathway, who just come into a bulk round and then have to find their way in a very, as I say, competitive environment. Um, oh, sorry, I think we had success um, The things that's made it work really well, from my perspective, one is a sustainable thing. If you really want to do something about diversity in any organisation, it can't be a quick thing, it's a long haul thing. Second, you have to be willing to adapt because the positive steps you take will have unintended consequences and you need to adapt. And I think you that show the ability to do that very well. Um, third, I think there's a key role for mutual support organisations. So what I've been seeing and hearing is that the Indigenous Employees Network has been absolutely vital to try to you know, really build um, a supportive environment for Indigenous employees. And I note that in some ways they've been trailblazers for others, so I understand there's now a uh, lesbian, gay, bi and transgender network, a disability network, there's other ways that officers are coming together. And the last point I suppose is that the vital role of high level support. Um, there's an Indigenous champion at Deputy Secretary level, and you can see here um, some of the words of the Secretary at the launch of the Indigenous uh, People's Strategy this year. Um, what I suppose has come through to me very clearly is just how deep the support is for the process. Um, when the Secretary says he expects every DFAT officer to think about reconciliation, to think about inclusion and exclusion, to stand up against racism, that's a strong statement. Whether that can always be brought into practice or not is a more difficult question. But what I would say is that Australia is stronger in its diplomacy the more it incorporates Australia's Indigenous heritage and represents the diversity of its society. Thank you.